Hello everyone. This week's lesson is on René Descartes and the beginning of modern philosophy. What we're going to see is a wrestling with the amount of certainty we can give to our experiences versus our reason. And Descartes is going to push the boundaries of what we can believe to be true. In his testing out of how much things can be believed, he's setting the groundwork for what we now know as modern philosophy. The result is an emphasis on individualism and personal experience with truth. This has both positive and negative consequences. So Descartes marks the beginning of the modern era in philosophy, which we can chart to around the year 1500. Now in order to get a handle on his ideas, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the historical context. Historians refer to the era from about 1400 to 1600 as the Renaissance, which means rebirth. At this time, Europe was rediscovering the ideas from the ancient world, notably the Greeks that we had covered previously, like Plato and Aristotle. And the question is for us, why all of a sudden, after hundreds of years of so-called dark ages, did European thought re-emerge and critical thinking start to take place again? Interestingly, Historians point to the Black Plague, which began in 1347, as a key causal factor for the European Renaissance. This plague, which wiped out anywhere between a quarter to a half of Europe's population, had wide-ranging consequences. The first result of the Black Plague was a loss of faith. You see, the Black Plague affected people almost randomly. You could be a devout believer in God, praying all the time, and still catch the disease and die, while criminals did not catch the disease and lived. So it seemed as though faith and prayer had no effect on whether or not you fell victim to this biological catastrophe. The result for those that survived was a loss of faith. Another consequence is what we now call survivor's guilt. You lose a family member or a close person to you and you start to think about what's the point of life? What, what can I do with my life to make it worthwhile? My friend or family member died. I have to do something to live up to their lost existence. There was a push to do something important. The next consequence is an odd one, increased wealth. Now, if you think about it, you have a fixed amount of wealth in the world, a certain number of farms and a certain number of gold coins. And if a quarter to a half of the population suddenly dies, the people that survive are fewer and they divide the wealth up accordingly. So the people that survive are automatically wealthier. This is a fairly grim way of looking at such a horrible event, but to use the cliched phrase, there's a silver lining to every cloud. So you take these factors together and you get the Renaissance. You have people that have more wealth, they feel more motivation to do something with their lives, and they're less concerned with being faithful or devout and, and obedient to God. So there is an interesting historical result, which is a rebirth of thought, critical thinking, funding for the sciences, and funding for the arts. At this time, there was an emerging conflict between science and religion. This is centered around the debate about geocentrism, or the notion that the Earth is at the center of the universe. 
Now, according to the Bible, the earth does not move. It is a fixed object at the center of creation. But according to the emerging science from astronomy, the earth rotates around the sun. Galileo was an astronomer who began to suggest that the earth rotates around the sun in his scientific writings. The Catholic Church was offended because this went against the word of God. So Galileo was put on trial and asked to recant his beliefs. He ultimately backed down from his statements, but the Catholic Church put him under house arrest for life just to keep him under wraps and also potentially to send a message to other scientific or critical thinkers to watch what they say. Interestingly, René Descartes, the author we're looking at this week, was working on this very question and decided not to publish his works talking about the earth moving around the sun. In a letter to a friend, he said, He who lives well, hides well. Now, if we're going to talk about the historical and cultural trends of the era in which Descartes lived, we have to mention the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest who, in his studies of the Bible and theology, began to bump up against the traditions of the Catholic Church. He started to think for himself about what it really meant to be a faithful Christian and challenged the Church's orthodoxy. This caused a lot of conflict and ultimately Martin Luther began a new church, the Protestant Church, and some people call the Lutheran Church, but this represents a schism between Catholic thinking and this new modern way of looking at the truth. The general trend here is people were beginning to challenge the authorities People were beginning to think for themselves, and this is the era in which Descartes was writing. So, our author for this week is René Descartes. You may have already become familiar with him, as he is the father of the Cartesian coordinate system, the XY axis, where we graph our equations. Okay, so Descartes studied astronomy, as I mentioned earlier. He was a mathematician, he studied geometry, but he also did some work in the field of philosophy, and this is what we're going to be looking at in this lesson. Here's how he opens his text. It is now some years since I detected how many were the false beliefs that I had from my earliest youth believed as true and how doubtful was everything I had since constructed on that basis. And from that time, I was convinced that I must once and for all seriously undertake to rid myself of all the opinions which I had formerly accepted, and commence to build anew from the foundation if I wanted to establish any firm and permanent structure in the sciences. So what's going on here with this text? Descartes is telling us that he's at a point in his life where he wants to be considered a serious thinker, a serious scientist or a serious mathematician, and he wants to contribute to our understanding of the world. In order to do that, he has to start somewhere. There has to be some first principles on which we can learn new facts. And he starts to realize that everything he's learned up to that point might have been false. Because there are certain things he's learned along the way which have turned out to not be true. Like, for example, that the earth doesn't move and sits at the center of the universe. So what Descartes wants to do in this text is talk about the things in the world which he doubts in order to cut down to the very base of what we can know for absolutely to be true. And things start to get a little weird. He starts out by doubting his senses. He says, 
all that up to the present time I have accepted as most true and certain I have learned either from the senses or through the senses. But it is sometimes proved to me that these senses are deceptive. And it is wiser not to trust entirely to anything by which have once been deceived. Now, what is Descartes' example of the senses deceiving us? Dreams. Descartes says that when you're dreaming, you think that what you see is real. Your senses are playing tricks on your mind. So, the senses are lying to you. So he says, Dreams come to us through the senses, but we know that what happens in dreams is not real. Therefore, we cannot trust our senses. Having eliminated evidence from the senses as a possible source of truth, or at least one which we can't be 100% certain about, Descartes pursues another line of thought about where we attain truth from. Descartes brings up truths of reason. Now you remember from our first lecture on epistemology, I said there were two general ways of attaining truth, either through experience or through reason. Now Descartes wants to doubt the truths we arrive at through experience, and the next up here is the doubts about truths arrived at through reason. Specifically here, he wants to talk about the truths of arithmetic and geometry, a favorite of Plato's. He says, these truths do not have the same character of evidence from the senses and can't be doubt doubted like dreams can be doubted. He says, whether I am awake or asleep, two and three together always form five, and the square can never have more than four sides. And it does not seem possible that truths so clear and apparent can be suspected of any falsity or uncertainty. He lets that sit for a minute, but then begins to question even these truths. Descartes defers to the existence of God as holding these truths in place. That God would not be so tricky as to make us think 2 plus 3 is 5 when it really was not. But then a few paragraphs later he says, well maybe an evil genius is manipulating us to think that 2 plus 3 is 5 when really it's not. Now, he, Descartes ultimately wants to defer to God as grounding rational truths, but it's still possible that there's this evil genius out there manipulating our understanding of arithmetic and geometry. So where do we stand? At the end, I feel constrained to confess that there is nothing in all that I formerly believed to be true, of which I cannot in some measure doubt. And that not merely through want of thought or through levity, but for reasons which are very powerful and maturely considered. Now, at this point, some of you might be thinking, these are not powerful and maturely considered reasons, just because your dreams lie to you doesn't mean that when you're awake, when you see the world in front of you, it's a manipulation. Just because there could be an evil demon manipulating your thoughts doesn't mean that 2 plus 3 is not 5. Now, it's okay to criticize Descartes on this point. However, if we take him at his word, and we seriously consider how we arrive at truth, 
things might not seem as certain as they did before we started this reading. And what is the temptation to do at this point? Descartes says, This task is a laborious one, and insensibly, a certain lassitude leads me into the course of my ordinary life. And just as a captive who is asleep enjoys an imaginary liberty, when he begins to suspect that his liberty is but a dream, fears to awaken, and conspires with these agreeable illusions that the deception may be prolonged. So, insensibly, of my own accord, I fall back into my former opinion. That is, all this doubting stuff is hard work. It's difficult to maintain a disconnect between the world in front of us and our thoughts in a sense that they're accurate to the world. It's easy to just go back to normal and say the world out there is just as I see it and the thoughts in my head are totally rational. But if we push ourselves, we are in this realm of doubt, and we might start to ask, well, what's the point of that? Isn't it just easier to go with what's normal? Okay, let's take a break from the text and talk about a film that makes use of these Cartesian ideas. The Matrix starring Keanu Reeves. In the film, the main character is an everyday employee of a regular corporation who just has this sense that there's something strange about the world and he can't quite put his finger on it. Along comes the character Morpheus who says, your suspicions are correct. There is something fundamentally wrong with the world. If you want to know the truth, take the red pill and I'll show you it. And if you want to stay in the world as it is, you can take the blue pill and go back to normal. Our protagonist takes the red pill, goes down the rabbit hole, and finds out the truth of the world. Now this is the science fiction part of the film. We're told that computers have developed artificial intelligence. There's been a war between computers and human beings. The computers won, and now human beings are kept as slaves and harvested for their electro engine energy to feed the electrical systems of the computers. How do you keep these human beings alive to be able to absorb their electrical brain waves? You have to give them a false reality through their brain. So these people are all asleep in these pods, but they think they're living alive, but their life is really inside of a computer program known as the Matrix. Our character comes out of his pod, he pulls the cord out of his brain stem and realizes he's lived his whole life under a manipulation. That everything he's been taught up to this point has been a lie and he's just starting to see the truth for the first time. So there's the world of the computer programs which Neo develops the ability to see the programming language behind it and manipulate things and fight the evil villains and then the action scenes continue and so forth. But in contrast to this computer manipulated world, we have our heroes living outside of the pods in sort of militaristic guerrilla warfare type lifestyle. They have you know, shabby clothes and military food and things are a struggle for them because they're fighting this battle with the robots. Okay? What I want to talk about right now is the character at the center of the screen, one of the people who's helping to fight the rebellion but is having second thoughts and wants to quit. He's inside the Matrix and he says, you know... I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put my mouth in it, the matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. 
And after nine years of struggling to fight the Empire, do you know what I realize? Ignorance is bliss. The reason this film is a classic is because it presents a choice to the viewer. Either you go with your everyday life and play along with the system as it is. Even though things might seem a little strange to you, you just accept things as they are. You don't think critically. You take the blue pill. Or you push the boundaries of what is normal. You take the red pill. You think for yourself. You see the painful, ugly truth and challenge things and make the world a better place or whatever the thing is. At this point in Descartes' essay, when he's talking about agreeable illusions and falling back into his previous opinions, he's speaking to the notion of people who just want to go along and get along. But he doesn't stop there. He wants to push further and keep doubting things until he reaches something that he can be certain of. But before he reaches certainty, Descartes talks about what it's like to be filled with doubt. When you're in that middle position between doubting things and you haven't yet reached a firm foundation. He says, The meditation of yesterday filled my mind with so many doubts that it is no longer in my power to forget them. And yet, I do not see in what manner I can resolve them. And... Just as if I had all of a sudden fallen into very deep water. I'm so disconcerted that I can neither make certain of setting my feet on the bottom, nor can I swim and so support myself on the surface. I shall proceed by setting aside all that in which the least doubt could be supposed to exist. Just as if I had discovered that it was absolutely false. And I shall ever follow in this road until I have met with something which is certain. Or at least, if I can do nothing else, until I have learned for certain that there is nothing in the world that is certain. This moment of total doubt is something that a lot of people feel in the modern era. There are so many things which are presented to us as being maybe true or maybe false that at a certain point in a lot of people's lives, people start to think, well, who knows if anything's really true? This is one of the starting points of the modern perspective, the modern view of things. I don't know what's true. I can't really trust anybody. Now, thankfully, Descartes does not leave us here, but some people do get stuck in this whirlpool of doubt and never really emerge and never really get onto some truth. Furthermore, some people start at this position of total doubt and uncertainty, and when they do find something they can latch onto it, they cling to it for dear life. So here's what Descartes gives us. He says, all right, this is what we can know with certainty, that we are thinking. The Latin phrase, cogito ergo sum, means I think, therefore I am. As Descartes puts it, I am, I exist, is necessarily true each time that I pronounce it or that I mentally conceive it. So, Everything you see in front of you could be a manipulation by the matrix, no different from a dream. The rational thoughts in your head about arithmetic and geometry could all be manipulated by an evil genius. So the truths of experience and the senses, the truths of reason, they could all be false. We could doubt all of that. But what we know for sure 
is that if we're thinking right now that we exist, there's something internal inside of us that is a really existent thing. Now, when I say something internal inside of us that is a really existent thing, what Descartes is ultimately going to argue for is the existence of a soul or a self. Something inside of us which is real. Now, this has consequences to this day in the field of philosophy of psychology. When people talk about an observer or a first person experience, it's something intangible. You can't prove to me that you are a thinking being. If I'm taking Descartes' skepticism seriously, I don't know if you're really having thoughts right now. But you do. This creates a very interesting result. We can say there's three major consequences of Descartes' philosophy, which create what we now call modern philosophy. The first is skepticism. I don't know if what you're saying is true. I'm not sure about the scientists. I don't really trust the mathematicians, the politicians, the religious figures. Everyone could be lying to me. I have to think things through for myself. This corresponds to something called subjectivism. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. You can think whatever you want, but I don't believe that you're telling me the truth. I have to decide for myself what's true. Now that has both good and bad qualities to it. Yes, it encourages people to think for themselves. You don't just listen to the authorities, you make up your own mind. How is this potentially dangerous? When it comes to matters of something like climate change, for example, or whether or not to vaccinate your children, is it really up to you, the individual, to decide the truth of these scientific questions? The last consequence of modern philosophy is this weird term, solipsism. Solipsism is the notion that you can't prove that anybody else is thinking but you. For all you know, you are the only really thinking individual in the world. Now this is sort of a sci-fi consequence, but it's also a cultural consequence. At the sci-fi level, we could say, who knows if you guys aren't all robots or part of the matrix. Everything could be a distortion, a manipulation. And that's sort of playful. And it's re if we're really honest with ourselves, it's kind of true. We don't know for sure that anybody else is really thinking anything. But on a cultural level, solipsism speaks to narcissism. This self-absorbed quality of modern culture. People are concerned with what they're doing they're taking selfies, they're talking about themselves on Instagram, they're concerned with how policies affect their lives rather than people out there. So, what starts out in modern philosophy as an emphasis on the individual, thinking for yourself, has good intentions, the consequences can lead to a sort of self-absorbed mentality. At the end of the day, the result of Descartes' meditations are interesting consequences for the field of philosophy of psychology, interesting cultural consequences about subjectivism. But there's a certain degree of a pushback against the scientific field with Descartes. Yes, he wants us to think for ourselves, I think therefore I am, and all that sort of stuff. But he also said that we shouldn't trust the evidence of the senses and defers his knowledge of arithmetic and geometry as being grounded in God. 
So, Descartes is referred to as both a modern philosopher as well as a rationalist philosopher. But what's interesting about Descartes' philosophy is he sets the stage for the next generation of philosophy. The Enlightenment philosophers that follow Descartes' footsteps pick up on his skepticism against the senses and start to really hammer against rational truth and really hammer against belief in God, belief in the souls, and all the metaphysical stuff that comes with it. So I want to close out the lesson by mentioning two figures in the Enlightenment era that take up where Descartes leaves off and start to think very critically about metaphysics in general. These figures are John Locke and David Hume, and they are important to understand in the context of next week's philosopher, Immanuel Kant. John Locke is famous for at least two reasons, one of which was his political philosophy, which was a huge influence on American political philosophy. He talks about life, liberty, and property as being natural human rights. But for our purposes here, we need to talk about his epistemology. John Locke is famous for asserting that the mind is a blank slate, the Latin phrase tabula rasa. He says, how comes the mind to be furnished? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To answer this in one word from experience. John Locke believes all our knowledge comes from experience. There is no such thing as pure rational truth. This is something a lot of people believe in, but is something Immanuel Kant will reject. Then we have David Hume, who doubts the existence of God, souls, knowledge of cause and effect, Platonic forms. David Hume is considered the most skeptical philosopher ever. In a famous passage, he says, When we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, Does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. What Descartes started creates a field of philosophy that gets a little strange. Philosophers start to ask themselves these strange questions like, how do I know that the tree that I see in my head is really the same thing as the tree that exists out there in the world? Is there even really such a thing as out there in the world? And how do I know that? While this may seem a little weird, the idea that Descartes starts with is, what do I know for sure? If I want to draw these huge conclusions about the world around me, like what's the meaning of life, or is the sun moving around the earth or not, and all these kind of things, you have to start at the beginning. What is out of there in front of me right now? Is the world that I see with my eyes really there? And what can I know about it for sure? Furthermore, these truths that I arrive at through my own thinking, are they really true? What do I really know? So, while Descartes starts out by wanting to get to the solid foundation of truth, he opens up this Pandora's box of doubt, which we are still left with today. But for the record, he did give us something, which is, I think, therefore I am. Whether that's good or bad as a starting point, I'll let you all decide. 
Once again, thank you for your attention. I look forward to your participation on the discussion board. Have a great week.